Welcome to the Photoshop Show. This is episode 25 of the Photoshop Show. And tonight, we have an amazing guest, someone that I'm so honored to have on our show, and that is Elisa Camahort Page, the co founder of Blog Her, which is the premium women's blogging network and uh, cross media platform network for bringing women together online. And so we're going to have Elisa telling us all about Blog Her and the latest, uh, what's going on there, the latest in Blog Her. And we also have an amazing panel down at the bottom of the screen um, who are going to chat with Elisa. And so before we do anything else tonight, um, I'd like all of those wonderful people to introduce themselves. And by the way, if you're probably watching the, the stream right now, but if you wanted to tell your friends, normally you can watch the stream on Ron Clifford's um, you can watch the show on Ron Clifford's stream, but Ron is in Haiti doing a humanitarian project this week, so he's not with us. And instead, we have Mr. Dave Bell filling in for Ron, and so you can watch the show either on Dave Bell's stream or in the event stream, the event announcing the Hangout. And then later, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube on uh, Dave Bell's uh, YouTube channel, and I'll also put a link to it on my YouTube, YouTube channel. Makes sense. Or, and it will always stay in the event, so we can always get back to it. The event will stay there, and it will be there. That's right, and you can reach your events by going over to the column on the left side of Google Plus and clicking on events. So, with no further ado, I would love to know who's down there in the panel, starting way over on the left with Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Wen. I'm a photographer in Naples, Florida. I'm very, very, very excited to be a panelist on the Photoshop. Photoshop show, and um, I think that's it. I'm just excited because I'm with hanging out with all my friends again. It's great. It's true. What have you been doing? We haven't seen you in a while. I am actually a co-host on the Pinterest show with Calibra, Jason Joseph, uh, Calibra Kelby, Jason Joseph, and Ronnie De um, Domenico. She's gonna hurt me that I mess up her last name. But we actually have a show on Thursday, and it airs 7.30 Eastern Time on cool. Calibra Kelby's um, uh, stream. And it's all about Pinterest. Is that what you said? It's all about Pinterest. And we have a few segments. We have the on-the-spot do-it-yourself. Um, that's 15 minutes that I have to do a never-before-you've-done-before uh, do-it-yourself project. We have Ronnie's cooking channel, which or Ronnie's cooking segment, where she cooks for 15 minutes. Uh, Calibra does traveling, and Jason Joseph does celebrities, and he's the answer man. So he answers everyone's Pinterest questions. And if you watch, you must bring chocolate. You That's must bring chocolate. And we give away prizes, and we, have, we just have a lot of fun. That's really cool. I have seen a few episodes. It's a riot. <laughs> Great. And Dave Bell, thank you so much for sitting in and taking care of all the technical details behind the scenes. Tell us about you. Um. I am, my full-time job is as a uh, professor at a college. I teach information systems, uh, the computer uh, side of business, including uh, electronic commerce. So I have a, a great interest in um, online activities, uh, uh, particularly entrepreneurial use of social networking is, is one of my uh, big interests. But I, I got into Google Plus because of my love of photography. And that's you know something I love to take time to do um, and never feel like I have enough time to do it, but do it uh, as much as I can. And I've really been enjoying, enjoying being involved uh, on this Photoshop show. Uh, That's cool. Do your, do your students watch you when you're on Google Plus shows? You know, I haven't really told them about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my separate lives. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks again. We appreciate your help, and you've done a terrific job. Thank you. And our next uh, panelist is actually our special guest, Elisa Camahort Page. Elisa, tell us something about yourself. There's so much to tell, but a brief summary. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Elisa Camahort Page. I'm the co founder and COO of BlogHer. And um, I usually summarize myself with the three words in my Google Plus uh, profile, which is BlogHer, vegan, Macalite. That tells you just about everything I'm interested in, sad to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, if uh, people want to find you, where do they find you online? Well, blogher.com. Uh, actually, my Google Plus profile is a good place to find me, blogher.com, of course. And I'm Elisa C. on Twitter, and I'm pretty active there as well. Terrific. Well, we'll hear a lot more from Elisa later in the show. 
Um, next to Elisa is Erica. Hi. His hair looks gorgeous. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So, yep, um, I am a photographer. I am pretty active over on Facebook as well as Google+. Plus. Um, I've been um, taking a little bit of time lately to organize my huge photo collection and get them uploaded for stock. I'm exploring the stock world right now. And um, beyond that, I'm just here to learn and listen and l get excited. So... <laughs> Oh, that's really exciting to have stock, you know, be, to be selling your work on stock. And I would love you to come back and tell us how that goes and how you do it and all that stuff. I would love to. Okay, we'll put that on the list. And on the other side of me is Miss Karen Hutton. Hi, Karen. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm good. Where are you back from? I'm back from New Zealand. I'm back from New Zealand uh, after, my oh gosh, I've been gone, I don't know, two, three weeks. And uh, helping to teach Trey's, Trey Ratcliffe's big uh, New Zealand photo adventure over there. It was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I'm a photographer and I'm a voiceover professional. I'm the voice of Stuck on Earth, which some of you may know from the iPad. Um, Motion X GPS drive for the iPhone and lots and lots of other projects of, across the media divide, as they say. Um, and I have a website, KarenHuttonPhotography.com, and a blog, which <laughs> needs renaming, but it's blog.KarenHutton.com. Brand new. It's just in its infancy. But I'm very excited. So I'm really excited to be here with uh, with our fantastic guest tonight. So yippee. Yeah. And so your blog, you're, you're kind of reviving your blog, is that right? <clears throat> yeah, I had one that was uh, sort of voiceover related, but I got bored. I didn't really do much with it, but I'm really excited because I have a vision for this one that is uh, quite a bit bigger than where it is right now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's really just starting, but I'm excited because I, I love having visions about things and then strategizing, okay, so what needs to happen next? And it's all fun and it's all good for everyone. And I just, I can't wait. I'm crazy that way. Karen, you know, how, how, I'm sorry, Dan. No, go ahead, Anna. <clears throat> how are little galleries going? Little Galleries is another project I've got going on. It's going well. It's going very well. Um, Little Galleries is like a, a gallery of photographers with music and voice and photos. And uh, the last one we did was a compilation of, mm, I think we had 20 photographers on that one, for Valentine's Day, which told a story of love. And you can find that at littlegalleries.com, L-I-L, -L, Life is Light. I was going to um, say that I'm interested to see how your blog will interact with your social media presence. Because, Elisa, Karen has, what, like 3 bajillion followers. How many followers do you have now on Google? I think it's 1.5 million on Google Plus and, I don't know, 170,000, I guess, on Facebook, something like that. Well, that's a bunch of people. And yeah. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if you can measure if they come over to your blog, too. Yeah, they're starting to. I'm, I'm working on how that's going to happen. That's all part of the vision because the blog can serve, can do things that I don't really choose to do on, and say, on Google Plus and vice versa. And I, in my mind anyway, I see how they can actually help one another and be like, you know, a really great brother and sister to one another without being the same thing. So, um, well, that's super, that's super smart because people actually use those tools. Different, they go there with different purposes in mind right. and right. sort of making your plans with that in mind is going to help you have a better result and make the most of each piece of what you're doing. Exactly. And I mean, there's the whole thing too where a blog belongs to you. I mean, Google Plus doesn't belong to me. Right. Um, so, I, of course, I think about everything I've done over the past you know, year and a half or more and going, wow, that doesn't belong to me. <laughs> But I get to build something new on the on the blog, and you know there's there've been things I've wanted to say and do, and that didn't specifically necessarily relate directly to photography, um, but that related to my world, the world of that I have to offer and to bring. So there's been a you know a part that I've actually had to sort of cut off that I can you know very easily and legitimately include in the blog. So. Um, for me, it's just a matter of getting my mind kind of wrapped around all the things that I do and how they weave together and how to present them um, on the blog, which I'm really excited about. But see, that's why I'm excited that you're here because, you know, you're the me you're the mistress of this. <laughs> you're the you know, whip-cracking mistress of this whole thing. <laughs> I like that. I like that, too. It just occurred to me. You can use that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know what occurs to me is that you would be a great speaker at one of the blog her conferences on this issue of how you take your amazing social media audience and bring it to your blog or vice yeah. versa. It's a different kind of it's a different kind of challenge. It really is. In fact, someone who comments regularly and I kind of know um, from Google Plus, and I've never actually met her in person, but we comment back and forth. She actually said, "How are you going to make your blog different than Google Plus?" Because starting, um, I, it wasn't too different because I, I really launched it just like I was getting on the plane to go to New Zealand and launch my blog at the same time, practically. So I didn't have a lot of time there to to really sort of dig in and write special things, but I ended up, you know, telling her that, yeah, it's going to be really different. I'm going to write different things and go into more detail and so on and so forth. And I thought, wow, that's really early on to be asked that question, but I'm just going to have to step up. <laughs> I'm excited to see what, what you're doing because for my blog, are you going to share your blog content throughout your social other social media networks? Yeah. You know, I mean, I probably shouldn't be answering this because I'm still learning. I should probably, you know, Elisa should probably be answering these <laughs> questions. But yes, I'm I'm going to have them all talking to each other. But different aspects of similar conversations and the blog hopefully going into other things that I probably wouldn't talk about on Facebook or Google+. That's That's my idea anyway. Well, we're excited. I'm excited. Good. I'm glad. I am too. That's great. Well, we're really happy about having you here tonight, Karen, and I hope you're not too exhausted after your amazing trip. No, I was at first, but now I'm starting to get all rip roar and excited and moving forward again. I slept 12 hours the first night I was home, which is, I never do that, ever. But there I was. <laughs> cool. Anyway. And we have one more wonderful panelist, Sandra Parlow. And thank you, Sandra. I know you had a million things you had to do tonight. But you made time for us, and I appreciate it. Thanks, Jen. Glad to be here. I kind of feel like a bit of an underachiever going right after Karen. Don't we all? <laughs> Next time she has to go black. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a photographer here on Google Plus. In my um, in my real life, I am a picture frame uh, business owner, um, and it's kind of interesting. I'm going to be uh, finding this really interesting tonight because I am not a blogger, and I've never really gotten blogging. I don't get it, <laughs> so I'm just gonna maybe I'll maybe this will turn me around, and I'll get it after this is all over. So. <laughs> It took Thank me you. a while to decide whether I had something to say and then, you know, if I had something to say, whether it was good enough, whether somebody even would want to hear it and how to frame it. It's, I mean, it's really taken me a long time to even decide I, I wanted to go there because it's, it's a time commitment. So mm -hmm. you, you're allowed to take your time and think it, <laughs> it's okay. And I'm a blog reader, not a writer. I'm always embarrassed of my writing ability. So, but I absolutely adore everything about blogging but actually physically doing it. So I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super excited because I don't know if what I did with my website is even smart. I mean, it's, I call it my, my web blog. It's, it's just a straight blog of my photography. When people go to my website, it's just, it's a blog. And there's no portfolio. The whole, it's just straight pictures and, and text. So... I think I'm a good writer. I don't know. <laughs> so, but I'm excited to hear more about like what others are doing in the blog world and how they're integrating it with their employment, their profession, their passions. So I'm excited. Well, that's the perfect segue, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Into hearing from our special guest, Elisa Camelhart Page, co founder of Blog Her. Elisa, I'm going to give the floor to you to talk about anything you want because it's all of interest to all of us here and I'm sure everybody who's watching the show. Well, thanks, Jan, and thanks, everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, the thing about blogging and the reason that I think it's still so powerful and um, has such impact on the lives of the people who take it up with passion is that it really is your own corner of the web um, that you own, that you own what it looks like and you own what you say and you own whether you choose to monetize it or not and you own how you share it. So many of the other platforms we all work on, um, we don't actually have that same level of control. And for those 
uh, people who are blogging, they are actually also the most likely to adopt all of these other social tools. But the blog is usually the sun in their solar, their social media solar system, and the other tools are kind of used to orbit and bring people back to their corner of the web and their place where they get to say what they want and control how it looks. So that's the beauty part of blogging is that it's really your platform and um, as Jay Rosen called it at our first blogger conference, it's your personal printing press. Um, Blogger was actually started in 2005, eight years ago now, and we started as a conference actually. So I, I met my first co-founder, Lisa Stone. Um, we had a friend, a mutual friend, who kept trying to set us up to connect because we were both talking about this newfangled blogging thing, and he thought, you know, we were probably the only two people in the world who cared about that. We should just talk to each other, and probably not to him. Um, and so we had lunch, and and. The, one of the subjects that was going on at the time was where are the women? And this wasn't just about blogging, it was right after, Car for those of you who are in Silicon Valley, it was right after Carly Fiorina got pushed out of HP. So there was a lot of where are the women in um, Fortune 500 boardrooms. It was right after the 2004 election, so there was not only where are the women in Congress, but where are the women on the Sunday morning op-ed pages, where are the women on the, to uh, uh, on the talk shows, um, there was the conversation of where are the women in tech, where are the women speaking at conferences. Um, and then finally, a political blogger wrote this post, where are the women who blog? And his, uh, it was a rhetorical question because his hypothesis was that women didn't blog, especially not about politics, because they didn't want to put themselves out there and express their ideas and mix it up with the rough and tumble world of political blogging. And so, a lot of the response to these issues that still bubble up sometimes uh, is to um, say, oh, let's make a list. Let's make a list of all the great women bloggers. So let's make a list of all the great women in tech. And what my co-founder, um, Lisa, said to me, and this is our very first date, so to speak, she said, what if, you know, instead of talking about it on our blogs, we just ask people to show up somewhere, ask women who blog to show up and say, we're right here, and we cover all the same topics than any tech conference or any blogging conference would cover, but all the experts are going to be women. We're not going to talk about being women, we just are going to be women talking about technology, talking about politics, talking about business, talking about all of these things. Um, and I don't know if it's particular to Silicon Valley, but I, I do think there is a, a bit of an atmosphere here of everyone's got a little something working on the side, everybody's trying to figure out if there's something they can own and that can be their own. And so when she said that to me, I, w I said not only would I be interested in that and would I like to go to that, but why don't we just do that? And that's really how it started. We just we didn't know each other before that day. We just decided to do this thing. And after a couple of weeks, um, we realized it was going to be a lot of work. Um, so I had met our third co-founder, Jory Desjardins, sitting next to her at a conference had had like a 45 minute conversation with her in which I thought she's pretty cool, she gets it. And so I just called her up and said, hey, you wanna help? And that's actually how the whole thing was born. 120 days after you know we said we had this idea, we had the first blogger conference, Jan was there. Um, and it was 300 people who showed up and said, here's where all the women bloggers are, what are you gonna do about it? Let's, let's get some attention going. Let's make sure that we're not recreating um, private spaces or exclusive spaces online, um, let's make sure it's visible, what women are up to. And um, from there, we just asked the women who showed up and the women who expressed a lot of interest but couldn't show up, what did they want to do? How would they want to bring more exposure to what they were up to? And there were really three answers. And from that, we ended up doing three things which is still what we do today. So the first answer was, there is something about face-to-face -face communication that just can't be replicated. And I mean, this Google Plus Hangout is great, and Skype, and FaceTime, and all those things, but you know, meeting people in person is awesome. So we want, when's the next event? And then the second thing was, and yet, we can't meet every day, and I didn't know there were all these other women blogging about this same topic, and where can we find each other? Because there was no central place to find other women who blog. So that's why we launched blogher.com a few months later. And then the third piece of feedback from a significant subset of attendees was, 
I wish um, I wish there was a business model. Uh, I think I found something that I love and that I'm good at. Why can't uh, you know the whole do what you love the money will follow why can't that be true about this and so that's why we launched the influencer network and started to try to get women paid for their work because there's a whole lot of philosophy out there that what's on the internet has to be free and that women create and, and men people creating content on the web are doing it for free for the benefit of other companies and we were like why can't we work together to get paid for our work for the benefit of ourselves you know so that was how we launched um, the influencer network and those are still the three things we do today we do conferences and our annual conference is now 5,000 people um, you know from the 300 we sell blogger.com where we're our whole mission is to spotlight what women are writing about online and we have our influencer network which reaches 55 million visitors a month across 3,000 blogs um, and last year to the point about wanting to help people make money last year we sort of analyzed what we had done from the period of the beginning of 2009 to the end of 2011 so three years and for many of us it's the worst three years in the economy that we can remember and probably that we were adults for I certainly remember you know the 70s economic recession I remember other bad economic, economic times but this has been probably the worst and slowest recovery and in those three years we paid the women in our network 17 million dollars for their work wow. and that has been um, what we are here for is to provide economic empowerment to go along with the community and the exposure for their work and education at our conferences um, so that's still what we do today and the, the fourth thing we have kind of added is we do research. We do a lot of research about uh, women and their behaviors online. Women are the drivers of most online activity when it comes to social. Women are the majority of users and they drive the majority of engagement and they certainly, when we know in the real world, they control the spending. You put all that together and that's why women are so um, sought after by marketers. Is that um, why you think Pinterest is growing so rapidly? Yeah, so Pinterest has really, it's been a phenomenon. You know, it is, it's a couple of things. I think women are the drivers, for sure, of Pinterest. I think imagery, and you all are photographers, something we've really noticed is a huge trend is photography and video, driving what people want to do on the web. We have increased tremendously the programming we do at our conferences. We have dedicated tracks now for photography and for video. We added a whole pre-conference day for just photography and video called Viewfinder Day uh, for our summer conference this July. And the thing about Pinterest is I think it really captures um, I always say that the rest in Pinterest is significant because I think it's this lovely leisure activity of your, your, you're just scrolling your way through things that make you feel good, if, if, just imagining doing them. Uh, sometimes I say that Pinterest is where I collect all the things I'll never be crafty or have enough time to do. But I do actually try to cook recipes from Pinterest. I'm not, I'm not totally capturing only things I won't do. Um, so I think the fact that it's image-based I think the fact that it has a clean and simple layout, it's like a, they've really gone for less noise. I heard that they're redesigning to add more noise, and I actually wonder if they have women on their design team and, and if that's really going to be successful for them because what I think has been successful is the cleanness of the experience and controlling how much noise you let in and out of, of what you look at. So. Um, but women are also the drivers of Facebook's traffic and Twitter's traffic. Um, Facebook owes its valuation to women, no doubt. Not only are they the majority of users, but they spend way more time interacting. Um, so people like to sort of, you know, I've, I've never been one for saying that Pinterest is the woman's network um, because they all are. And that would be my, <laughs> that would be my contention. Do you know anything uh, about Google Plus or does so, anyone down there? Um, so I was going to actually show a couple of, sorry? I was going to ask if you know any statistics about Google Plus and the presence of women or the percentage of women who drive the traffic here. Oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, last year we actually tried, we've been doing an annual study since 2008 about women and their social media usage. Um, and last year we tried to include Google Plus 
and it actually wasn't successful. The number was actually so huge that we think people were not familiar enough with Plus to distinguish it from Google. So we, it was Q1 of last year. So when we were asking people how frequently do you use Google Plus, we were getting like 80% of women were saying daily. And so we, we believe that they were not familiar enough yet to distinguish it. And we hope that this year we will get a better reading and we'll also look at how we whether we should spell out the plus or whether we should provide a link or what we need to do something to make sure people do not confuse it. So unfortunately in our own annual study we did not get um, a, a good reading uh, because of that. We we're pretty convinced the number, we threw the number out. We didn't think it was at all real. Um, you know, I, I've been on Google Plus since day one and um, I have, it's the one area, I mean I actually have more followers of Google Plus than some of the platforms I've been on I've been on Twitter since 2006, and I have way more people following me on Google Plus. So I feel, you know, I'm I feel a sense of, you know, obligation. I'm posting pretty frequently, and I used to follow quite closely the whole estimations of the gender breakdown, and um, and I stopped paying attention to that. Just as I, maybe this is bad to admit, but I don't really pay attention to too much about traffic and followers and numbers on any of the platforms on which I participate. Um, you know, for me, that's not the driver of why I participate on any of them as an individual. Is 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 how you know how big I am, or how many people follow me, or I will say that I, I, I we see distinct differences in what good these platforms have. If you are looking to drive to either your mm. personal brand, um, or to your personal brand, or to your company. Um, we really see a big difference. Twitter is sort of this enclosed universe where people are having conversations. You can get a, a ton of retweets and think, I'm going to get so much traffic from that, and it's, it's really not reflective of the traffic you'll get. People see who you are, oh, I trust that person, that sounds like an interesting headline. The friction involved with retweeting is minuscule, so you get all these retweets without people ever having checked. Um, what you were, what they were actually retweeting, and the other reason is because it's it's gone. It's gone in a few weeks. You can't find what anyone tweeted. So there's not this sense of responsibility around tweeting. Facebook, on the other hand, when someone shares on Facebook because they know that the the universe of people who are going to see that share is different and it's more. You know, most people aren't that savvy about their privacy settings, so they think pretty carefully before they share. And a share is much more translating to they probably looked at what it was. You know, their mom might be on Facebook. Their, their boss might be on Facebook. So before they share something, it's much more likely they looked themselves. So, um, sorry? I'm sorry. Would you equate um, Facebook's like button with, like, a, the Twitter retweet? Um, but even that, it shows up. It shows up on your profile. It's there forever. I, I actually did a whole Facebook cleanse a couple weeks ago after, um, perhaps after they announced Social Graph, I spent my weekend going back all the way to 2007 and looking at everything I ever liked, everything I ever um, <laughs> became a fan of, and any picture that was tagged with me, um, any anything like that, and I cleaned out the ones I was, most of them it was just I didn't remember anymore. Um, like why I had liked that or what it was. <laughs> like friends ask you sometimes to like things to support them and then three years later you're like I have no idea what that even is and so I just went through and cleaned it out. So I think even the like has a little more reflection on you um, than a retweet um, and it's there forever. Uh, and like retweets are kind of, I mean Twitter is an extremely ephemeral um, environment. It's great for just sort of branding awareness and getting awareness out there. Um, but I think that Facebook is a little bit more intense in as far as um, someone who's sharing something probably has some interest in it, probably has looked at it, and has considered what they're looking at. Um, but the thing that, and then the thing with Pinterest is that Pinterest has two qualities it shares um, with uh, blogs and social media. It's kind of this hybrid because it definitely shares this, um, it's a way of recommending. It's a way of saying, I like this, right? That's It's very visual. It's very, um, 
it's very specific. You know, it's individual things, items, recipes. But it's also really fun for the user. So there's a very, um, there's an externally facing aspect to it where I'm, I'm recommending these things to you and I want you to see them and share them. I'm curating for you. And there's also this very, it's just fun for me to look through all this stuff. All the stuff I never repin is equally fun for me to look through, you know, and just sort of, uh, you know, either fantasize about doing someday or laugh about what other people like to do or whatever it is, you know. So there's sort of this, this both externally focused and internally satisfying aspect to it. But what it doesn't do very well is get you to the result. Like it is very easy for um, is very easy to click on something thinking you're getting to the source of a pin and you're really like four clicks away from it. And it is very easy. Like if you see something and you really want to buy it, there's that can be depending on what it is. It's a completely erratic experience. Sometimes you may be successful. One click will get you to where it's someone's store and you can go through and do that. And sometimes it's like it's a, a rat hole a rabbit hole, I guess, that you never get out of trying to actually figure it out. So, so do you think the, that, can you, do, do, does, if, can you drive traffic? Do you see that there's a good drive of traffic that way? I mean, Pinterest is a great traffic driver. It's, it really is. Because you, like, um, because most of what's there has some has some dimension to it. You don't you see a picture of a recipe, you're actually probably going to want to look at the recipe to know if you want to make it and to know if you want to share it. You see a craft project, you're actually probably going to click on it and see well how many steps are there and how many, you know, how difficult is this going to be? So there is uh, we have found Pinterest is actually our number one social referrer now to the Pinch, uh, to the blogger network. That's uh, what I was wondering past Facebook. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, absolutely. But it really works with certain kind of content that's very visually oriented. Although I will say, even that is changing. I mean, posting infographics. We post our infographics now on Pinterest. That works. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, um, deep thoughts by Jack Handy type. Uh, <laughs> that aged me right there. That dated me. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, like, um, you know, uh, phrases and and inspirational thoughts that get shared. So it's, it's moving away from being just style, food, and crafty and, and expanding its horizons. Um, and, uh, but I think, again, it, it is pretty uh, image-oriented. Would you mind, Elisa, if I uh, change the conversation from Pinterest over to BlogHer and its ad network? Can you tell us something about that? Because I was really intrigued when you said there's there's nothing wrong with asking for money, and, or when you suggested, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking to get paid for what you do, um, and how you guys are approaching that with the ad network, and also yeah. what kind of advertisers you're focusing on. Well, um, our perspective is that uh, be, when marketers seek to work with social media people, they're either asking them to be writers, they're asking them to be marketers, they're asking them to, to um, they're asking them to do functions that have a value in the real world. And so to us, there's no reason they shouldn't have a value in the online slash social world. It makes no sense. Um, there's time involved, there's effort. Um, so you know the expecting people to market your products for free or write about your products for free or do anything for free when you wouldn't expect a copywriter to do that you wouldn't expect a magazine to to put a you know an ad in their um, magazine pages for free I mean it's just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it is devalued in fact we know that it's valued you can actually track what happens from when they see something on the internet track where people go and track what they're interested in so um, our perspective is that you're paying for the work. Now, when it comes to things like reviewing products and things like that, we um, we hire writers. Um, so we're sort of the publisher. We hire the writers, and they write their reviews. And um, again, we're paying for their time to produce a professionally created review with images and sometimes video, and it's a very thorough. Um, and it is not a paid endorsement in that they are not paid to have a particular opinion. They are just paid to share their opinion, whatever it may be. 
And so, um, yeah, and that's, that's, it's, um, there's a value to the marketer and there's value associated with your time and your, the content you create, you know, and there's, they can call it different names. So now I guess native, native advertising is like the, the buzzword right now. And all that is, is all it ever was, which is branded content, which was advertorial in, you know, magazine days. And I remember in my old tech marketing days, you know, I, I, advertorial was one of my marketing channels that I would, or marketing tools that I would employ. And that exists today. So we can call it different things, but that's what it basically is. And if someone in the print world would get paid for it, why on earth wouldn't someone in the internet world get paid? So how does that influencer network you mentioned work? So um, we have, if you go to blogger.com and click on, um, I think it's advertise, um, there's a section where you fill in, you can, you can submit your blog and actually want to run advertising. Um, or you can also just submit, hey, I don't, I don't really want to run ads on my blog, but I want to, this is my following. Here's, here's where I actually have influence. Um, whether it's Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or wherever it is and um, you sign up and then what we try to do is align opportunities with people who have some um, relevance that the that the the customer that we're working with is relevant to the bloggers at hand so I always use this example because it's stuck with me it's um, it's been a few years now but Disney once worked with us they had a direct to DVD Tinkerbell DVD coming out. And so, you know, you're not going to find that in any pro, it's not a profile point that we collect. Do you like Tinkerbell? So we reached out to our network and we're like, hey, anybody into Tinkerbell? So it turns out she kind of has a cult following. Like adult women who don't even have children are super into Tinkerbell. Not like everybody, but like several hundred people. We're like, I love Tinkerbell. <laughs> and we're like, awesome. Now, and that doesn't mean actually that they're going to automatically give a good review to Tinkerbell. In fact, they may be a lot more invested in, you know, does this, does this uh, fit within the Tinkerbell mythos that I am very invested in? But that investment and that passion for the topic is what we're looking for um, because it has to be, someone really has to care. If you're writing about something, you really have to care. You have to have an authentic interest and an authentic opinion that is the only way you have influence. You don't have influence because of numbers. You have influence because people believe what you say. Um, and so it's, it's incredibly important that people only work on things they're interested in, only share opinions that are real, and always disclose, disclose, disclose if there is any material relationship going on and a blogger has hired them to do anything. And that way you can strike that balance between making a living and, you know, continuing to use your blog as your personal platform. So what do you guys think about that, that as photographers, in, which is a somewhat a male audience, I'm imagining, as we're discussing in our personal chat here? <laughs> Ask the question again. What do, what do we think about advertising? What do we think about um, combining personal with commercial or all of the above? All of the above would be fine. <laughs> what are your thoughts about getting into the advertising? Can, can we as women photographers or post process, you know, I'm an expert in Adobe stuff, so can we monetize what we know or are we, are we in this world where women really aren't valued as much or perhaps are over outnumbered, let's put it that way. I see women photographers monetizing constantly. Um, Click and Moms is a huge avenue for that. Um, lots and lots of women have their um, their presets and their actions for sale. Um, they do, they give away freebies on their blogs to drive traffic and then they are selling products constantly. I don't think that it necessarily takes away. I think that it's a value added product um, and I think it gives them clout and respect if, if they have a following of people who will pay for their products. Do you think there's just too much stuff that's free out there to break into the monetizing aspect of it? 
Me, personally, absolutely not. Um, I think that people want a quality product, and if you have good reviews out there, people are willing to pay for it if they trust the source. And they trust the source by getting to know you personally through other aspects of your blog and through being able to communicate and get to know you as an individual through what you write that isn't being monetized. Um, they trust you, and they want um, what you can create. So I think it's a great balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, I think <clears throat> I think anyone who builds a following, who creates a world, you know, that other people want to be a part of, um, you know, anymore, you can't just hang out a shingle and say, I do this and expect people to come. Now it's like <clears throat> you have to create a world and this is the sun I live under and this is, these are the thoughts I think and this is my philosophy and this is what I, what this is what I'm about. You mean, you have to really bring it on so many levels. Um, but I think everyone expects... I think everyone expects some free stuff, but I think everyone expects and wants to pay for some paid things, you know, if they've if they've signed on to be part of your world. But I think that's the, our responsibility is to create a world people want to be a part of. And I think what's great about that is that it's not just a drive for individuals or solopreneurs or small businesses. This is becoming a drive that bigger companies have to worry about. They have to worry about who they say they are in the world and how they back up who they are in the world. They have to show how they act in their community. They have to show how they behave with their consumers. Social media has been transformative for the power of the consumer. But it's also, people think it's one-sided, but the company, these brands now have the opportunity to listen to their customers in a way that they never had before. Um, and I think it, it can only drive us to a more um, responsible uh, form of capitalism, hope, hopefully, in this country. But it also knocks down these barriers, not just between in individuals, but it's, it's sort of flattening things out. So mm -hmm. it's tough as a company to know that consumers expect that they should be able to tweet out at you and get an answer. And I'm like, well... So sorry, but you should be I, glad they want to talk to you at all. I like, just bought this book because Nicole tweeted it and said, look at I created. Now, On One isn't something I would normally go out and buy a book for, but because I trusted her and her stuff on social media, I went out and paid for her book. You know, it wasn't a gift. I went out and bought it on Amazon. And so I do think that I trust On One because a lot of the people that I respect are supporters and fans of them. So it does influence, and it is a relationship that goes back and forth. And I think Smug Mug does a great job with that as well. And I think, yeah, it's great. So, But her blog is driving people to other products and other avenues that she has. And same with Jan. I, you know, I'll pay for lynda.com because um, of her presence. And that's, you know, how it kind of works. <laughs> Oh, that's really nice. Thank you, Erica. I thought, I thought many, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's interesting because we, a lot of our research focuses on this trust versus influence and then making people act, right? What converts someone from just saying, oh, that's cool, she's into that, to actually going and buying a book, and I'll just show you something um, really quickly, um, which is from our research, let me open it here, which is that we asked this year about these four main um, uh, social tools, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. We said, we asked users of each tool, so people who actually use these tools, do you trust the information and advice that you, that you find there? And you can see that across the board, people say yes, both the general population and the blogger sample. But what is different is then you say, well, have you ever actually made a purchase and then you can see the numbers change a little bit. So that converting into action for the actual user base is really high for blogs. It's actually pretty high for Pinterest, and I think it would be even higher if they made it easier to buy. But you can see that that converting into actual action for Facebook and Twitter is, is lower, even though they trust the information. And it's because when people are on Facebook and Twitter, they're not looking for something to shop for or buy. They're not, they're not looking for that kind of... Um, deeper information. They are looking to engage, they're looking to have a conversation, they're looking to um, you know have personal inner communication and transaction, not commerce. 
And so I think there are other places. So that's something to think about too, where you're promoting your ideas and your voice and your personality and your conversation versus where you have a chance to dig deeper into your products and your offering and what you have on offer and, and where you're going to find more fertile ground for that. So, Elisa, what else is going on at BlogHer? Um, I know you have multiple conferences coming up. Can you tell us something about those? Yeah, absolutely. So, actually, our next conference might be of interest to, to many photographers because I think of photographers as business people, small business people. Our next conference is BlogHer Entrepreneurs. It's March 21st and 22nd um, at the Microsoft campus in, um, in Mountain View. And this was actually a conference we started two years ago in response to not where are the women who blog, because we don't think people ask that anymore, but where are the women starting companies. So we have 100 attendees and we call 50 women we know who are already VCs or you know entrepreneurs who have had some sort of blessed event or exit or lawyers or financial experts, but you know 50 very senior women and we ask them to come together not just for educational programming, but we set up mentoring matches so that every attendee gets a mentor, that they get to talk to about a specific business problem. Um, and then there's peer networking and then there's programming. So we um, that's March 21st and 22nd. This will be the third year we're doing it. Um, and it's a really great event for inspiring you to take whatever it is you're doing to that next level of your from a business perspective. Um, then we have Blog Her Food in June in Austin, and that's our fifth year doing that, and it's, um, it's a great event. Food bloggers are super serious, and they are very into their photography, I can tell you. Um, we've had a photography track as part of Blog Her Food since the very first year because it's so, it's so necessary uh, for most great food blogging. And then our annual event is this July in Chicago this year. It's the third time we're back to Chicago. And in addition to the annual conference itself, which has tracks about personal blogging, political blogging, professional blogging, technical topics, we also have these three pre-conference days, including Viewfinder Day, which is really focused, one track focused on photography for a whole day, and one track focused on video for a whole day. And it's for more senior, it's for more advanced level folks. We also have photo and video programming during the main conference, but the Viewfinder Day is a little uh, next level. So I can't tell you how excited that makes me. You know, yeah. I remember the days back when we had one panel on food photography. Do you remember? Yes, you know, the yes. Lisa Bauer and so, yeah. and so it's wonderful that everyone is seeing the value um, yeah. of, of the image. Yes, for important. sure. Cool. So those are the upcoming conferences, but there's more, is there? Well, we um, we have our influencer network, which is now we recently. It did used to be that you had to have a blog that you wanted to run advertising on to be part of that, and we've only expanded it over the last few months to be more inclusive for any kind of social part of your social graph that you want to be able to um, leverage and leverage your reach and your influence for to monetize. So that's really open to everybody. And um, the last thing we're really focused on is mobile. Um, we know that uh, so much of our audience is now. Um, reaching Blogger and its network through mobile devices. So we're very focused on tools for mobile and improving not only our mobile presence as blogger.com, but the 3,000 bloggers that we work with. Um, it's actually a challenge for most bloggers to make sure that their mobile site is as rich and as useful and as easy to navigate as their web-based site so, or their browser-based site. So, um, so we're looking to help our whole community with that. And we just released today, I'll show you really quickly, we don't have to walk all through it, but um, we released today this infographic. Um, here it is. That basically people have this impression that the millennials are the mobile generation, the native digital generation. We did our second annual study of consumer electronics usage and found that as far as women go, we are all the mobile generation now. Um, we did tease out some differences between um, the generations in general uh, perspective. And it's actually, sometimes it's very what you would expect, but sometimes a little counterintuitive. Like the millennials are actually not likely to be early adopters, not likely to buy every new device because 
they probably don't have the money to, what with the economy and the unemployment rate of millennials specifically. So they're very, um, very attached to using a gadget till it doesn't work. They're very afraid it will get stolen. Meanwhile, the Gen X woman is very the most likely to label herself early adopter. She's really about multitasking. She wants it to do it all. Um, and then, interestingly, you know, her greatest fear about her mobile device is that it keeps her too distracted. I, I could relate to that. I'm actually a young boomer, but I relate a little bit more to the Gen X myself because um, I am an early adopter, and I do get I do get complaints about my level of distraction. Boomers are at this point as adopted and mobile as just about any other folks, um, and they're they're getting new devices more quickly than the millennials. They will wait to see if the, they'll introduce a new fee, uh, new device and get the next to last because it's a little less expensive. They really like to get a good deal, but they are adopting mobile to the same degree. It really goes to show anyone who's using the, the cliche that this is so easy your mom could use it or your mom would adopt it really isn't paying attention um, because uh, you know your, your moms and your dads and probably your grandmas are all using mobile devices. They're using smartphones. They're using social tools. They're using Facebook. Um, and it's just a different different world than it was 10 years ago. Were you going to show us an infographic to go with that? And that, I uh, see there's a question about the infographic. So it's, I, I definitely, let's see, I will share the, the link. It, uh, we released it today on blogger.com, so you can go to blogger.com slash research and find it there, and you'll find all our other studies. The other study I showed as well, you'll find. So... So who's doing your studies? Do you have a separate division or people you hire? How does that work? Yeah, so we have a, a director of market research um, who uh, I work with, and we actually have our own research panel that we've developed. We were we used to just send you know sort of spray things out in um, ads or or social, and uh, but now we've built this panel of almost four thousand women. We also go and use the general population. We use samples from a variety of places to do a comparison. Uh, but we do all the design and the implementation and the analysis and reporting and even the design of the infographics and the studies uh, presentations ourselves in-house. I see. I love that you guys do research because there's just... Sorry, I had to try it. I'm like looking all at your research. Um, I have a psychology background, so all of this is so interesting to me because it's it not only it's not just helpful for other women to see this research, it's also helpful for everybody to know where right. where we're going with our you know technology. Anyone who's interested in how the internet is going, where the internet is going, how social the interactions are going, is going to find this research so interesting. I also think it's sometimes a, a, a gut check against, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of, um, I always bring up the difference between the mainstream adoption of Twitter by regular people and its adoption by media. So if you were to believe the media representation, you would think everyone is using Twitter. I mean, the, there's a hashtag for every TV show. There's a hashtag on every magazine print ad. Every celebrity has a Twitter account. Those of us who are in marketing or social or, you know, in this whole space, we are all completely invested. But out in, like, the general population, it's, it's not. You know, it's there, the adoption's at, like, 20%, and that's what it's been for the last couple of years, and maybe it'll go up a point or two a year. But So it, it helps to do that comparison between the blogger folks and the general population folks helps show you where there's some gaps between those of us who are kind of, we're not regular people when it comes to some of this stuff. I always talk about the regular people and how they look at me like I'm crazy when I talk about Twitter, you know, and probably Google Plus too. <laughs> Yeah, I still have friends who are like, Google Plus is not dead. I'm like, oh my god, the Google Plus is so vibrant. Like, we're doing, like, all these awesome shows, and it's so much information, and you should really focus on, like, you should really watch some. And they're like, yeah. I don't have time for that. <laughs> so, you know, now that I've got you here, I, I need your advice as an expert on blogging. Okay. You, <laughs> so here, here's what I keep thinking. People say, 
oh, Jan, where is your uh, website? And I'm like, oh, my God, my website, you know, who has time for my website? I'm all on the, all this social media, and my business activities are online. I, you know, I do this training at lynda.com, and it's pretty much constant. You know, it's, it's like a full-time job. So my idea has been, well, I should be directing everyone that I meet on social media to my monetized business, which is lynda.com not to a separate blog page would be kind of a detour and I'm interested in what you think about that as more and more of us run our businesses online should we have a separate blog or should we be sending people directly to our business place well I agree with the statement that you should most think about driving traffic to where you control the experience and have the opportunity to monetize it um, giving you know people only have so much attention they'll only follow so many of your links so so focusing on where you're gonna get the most value and uh, it's totally what makes sense if that's on lynda.com or you know uh, I, I've even told like I've often told newspaper reporters who they're like I don't want to start a blog I'm already being made to do you know I'm not getting paid more to do all this stuff and I'm like but you know the newspaper business is pretty volatile maybe you want to have your own place on the web where you start to establish that people know where to find you so I think it depends on what industry you're in and, and what you're doing but I think you want to have a place that's your own that you control and that you monetize I totally agree with you and that and that's probably why I switched to a blog format for my website because when I go to other photographers' pages or other other musicians, I go straight to their blog because I want to see the most recent activities they've done instead of like the best that they've done. Yeah. I want to see the most recent. Have you seen a tr um, a, a, a shift with a lot of um, web websites moving to a blog format? Well, yeah, I used to. Whenever used to, people used to ask me, "Well, what's a blog?" I would always say, "Well, blog is you know it is a website." It's a kind of website. Um, it has some characteristics that are back in the day um, were different than traditional websites. But I think those lines are blurring, and you have the capability to do more with your blog as far as design, architecture, navigation than you used to be able to have. And so I, I don't think, I mean, to me, I think you can probably get by with one place on the web that features everything you're doing and connects everything you're doing. But some place is your hub. Some place no. is the place you want to be at the center. Mm -hmm. so what I've been doing is if a post is really interesting that I've done on Google Plus and there becomes a big discussion on it, I actually do a hashtag blog at the end and then it posts that whole discussion onto my blog. Now, um, and it's a great way for me to catch the posts that really have taken off. It posts the photo and then all the conversation beneath it. Because I kind of get a little afraid of posting on my blog and then only seeing maybe one comment or no comments. And so it keeps me from wanting to explore that further. And so I almost artificially boost it by having my Google Plus followers, all of their comments showing up on my blog. What is your... What if your blog doesn't get a lot of traffic or comments? I mean, do things like the taking the Google Plus stuff over to your blog? I mean, what what do you do to inc to make it seem that you're not blogging into nothing when you're just starting um, out? That's a great yeah, that's a great question. I think people have lost so back back in the day, people would ask, "How do you build your blog traffic?" And I, that's why I think of Google Plus more than anything as the big group blog that I've constructed because I have my circle that I follow, my preferred stream. And I've chosen who's in there and I see all their stuff and it's like this big group blog I made. But it captures something that was always sort of the answer about oh, how do you grow your blog. Well, you find other people who will be interested in that. You have them in your blog role. You link to them. You visit them. You comment on them. Um, and you start creating community um, and that's how people want to follow you back and find where you are and go see your stuff um, and that's true in any social tool but there are like in Google Plus that's true right you you interact you go see what other people in the community are talking about and participate it's the same on Twitter 
uh, anyone who uses any of these tools as a broadcast mechanism, you know, I think is limiting their possibility for what they'll get back. I think you, I think it's, you know, it's like what the Beatles said, you know, you get what you give, or maybe that's um, the new radicals. <laughs> I'm dating myself again, um, but you know, it's it's that you get what you give uh, in any of these social tools, and it will amplify um, what you're what you're getting as far as traffic and attention and conversation. But it's also true that you want to go if you have something. You know, our big philosophy to the brands, and I think this can apply to people, is you should go to where your customers are. You should go to where your community is. Don't always be about pulling them. So I know I just said have somewhere that's your hub, and I totally believe that. But that's at the same time that you're going out and cross-pollinating and being across the community. Because that's where your community is, and you can't only expect them to come to you. You have to go to them. In fact, you should go to them more often than, than you're expecting them to come to you. Because reciprocity, you know, is is a huge value of the social web and I still believe that really strongly and I still believe that most brands and most people it's hard to keep up and we lose our we lose our dedication to it and then that mysteriously coincides with us feeling like we're speaking into the void or we're not getting as much traction as we used to and we're not seeing that it's it's kind of interconnected does that make sense you know guys I I hate to put oh Dave did you want to say something Oh, um, I, as as being the uh, the one the one man here on the panel, I, I did notice on the site on the blogger site that there is a strong statement that you do have uh, a lot a lot of men involved with blogger in various ways. And I don't know if there's just a little bit you might say about uh, about that. We do have quite a few quite a few men uh, who are watching watching right now. So. We actually um, from the beginning. It, we always used to say we were by and about women, not just for women. And there, it sounds like semantics, but it actually has meaning to us. Um, so from the beginning, men are welcome at our events. There are men in our publishing network. What we do, what we do promise our mar the the marketers is that we're reaching an audience that's predominantly women. But there are male bloggers who are in our network who are reaching female audiences. We've had, um, we've sort of loosened up on having some male speakers. And what's interesting is that at our food conference, women are actually, there are far more women leading food web, uh, bloggers who are women. So we polled the community early on about how they felt about male speakers and, and we said that we felt they might be the ones that are having their lights hit under the bushel a little bit. And the community was like, oh yeah. So from the beginning, we've had male speakers at the food conference. So we um, are, are definitely not a female exclusive space. Um, and that's just been since, since day one. Great. Well, that, yeah, and it's true. I've seen um, Guy Kawasaki at the conferences. I've seen Robert Scoble and lots of other wonderful men. Um, so I hate to put the brakes on. This is so interesting. I have a million things I'd love to talk to you about, <laughs> but um, this is being recorded for YouTube, and so we try to keep it to about an hour. So I think we're going to wrap up the recorded portion of the show, but I do want to give an opportunity to anybody in our panel who has something they're dying to ask. It's now or never. Karen? Well, just the, you know, the conversion of, like you said earlier, um, I, I started off really on Google+. Plus. You know, that's where my whole social world took off. And <laughs> and now, you know, 1.5 million followers later, and uh, I think it's 165,000 on Facebook. And I'm like, now I want to start a blog. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the conversion, I mean, I, I spoke earlier about my idea about it, um, but... I think that's a, I don't know if that's a unique challenge or not. It is a challenge. No I'm kind of fascinated by what Erica said about having something she does that it sounded like you automatically pull Google Plus conversations onto your blog. Is that right? Yes, it is. I don't remember who made the link, but there Dan was a guy. It's Daniel who Treadwell, I think. Yes. Daniel Treadwell has a plugin that will automatically pull from that's Google Plus into a cool. WordPress. I forget um, what it's called. Do you remember, Dave? Uh, I don't know the name of it, but if you look for Daniel Treadwell on, on Google+, I think you'll find it. That's super cool. 
remember looking at that. And, and you can either set it to have anything you post on G Plus show up on your blog or set it to, if you put a certain hashtag in the G Plus posting, only those will, will, will go over to your blog. That's awesome, because I know... Um, and it, it, I, it comes with the comments as well. If there are photos and people that. commented on the photos, that all comes over to your blog too. That's great. That's wonderful. That's a great integration with, so that, like Karen, you have a huge following on Google Plus and a huge following on Facebook. Your blog can kind of be like your home base where everyone can find all your work mm -hmm. and you can have Facebook and Google Plus funneling into your blog. Yeah, it's the, it's the one place I have finally found that I can start corralling all these different things that I do that seem so disparate. Well, they seem disparate, but they're not. They all pretty much come from the same hub, but they go out into the into the whatever sphere and it's just gone. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, even I forget what I did. <laughs> it needs to all be, you know, somewhere I can look, even me can just look at it and go, okay, I did something. That's good to know. And <laughs> I did a lot of some things and, and they and they do represent when somebody says, well, why should I dot 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 with you? I'll say, well, here's here's my world, you decide. And it's, it's, it's really, I think, a, a, an important Part of the roundup, <laughs> so to speak. I'm sure that it will be successful. And I, you know, before we go, I want to really um, try to urge everybody out there, particularly the people, um, the women in the group, to go to a blog her conference. I have to tell you, I've been to a whole bunch of them over the years, and they are so inspiring. Um, I I am thrilled to meet my sisters in real life um, you know the people that we that we interact with every day here online it's above all it's incredibly fun it's incredibly inspiring you come home just filled with ideas um, it's economical none of these conferences will break the bank these are not four thousand dollar conferences and you know what's so wonderful is that everybody is accessible Elisa Lisa Stone, her partner, Jory Desjardins, they're all just regular folks like like us. And they're willing to share <laughs> what they've learned. And it's, you know, it's great. It's a great place to go. So try to go to Blogger 13 in Chicago, July 25th to 27th. Try to go to Blogger Entrepreneur. Is that what it's called, Elisa? Entrepreneurs, March, yes. Entre entrepreneurs in um, San Jose, March 21st and 22nd, because there you get to do one on one with some of the biggest names in the online and entrepreneurial world who also happen to be women and who can give you great advice. Um, so that's what I would do if I had the time, and I hopefully will be at Blogger this summer. Um, and you know, Elisa, I'll put it right out there for everyone to hear. I'd love to be involved in Viewfinder Day. I think I have a lot to offer that would help with that. So great. So that is our show for tonight. Thank, Thank you. you to Elisa Camhort Page. Thank you so much, Elisa, the, for your time. This was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We, I've Thank learned, you. We've learned so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. And our it. panelists, you're wonderful as always Anna Wynn, Dave Bell, Erica Thornis, Karen Hutton, and Sandra Parlow. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy evenings um, to be with us tonight. Yay. So, Thanks that for wraps up us. the Photoshop show. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Two weeks. Two weeks.